So the next question is, can you explain the use of the term law in the book of Romans? Particularly the person asking the question pointed me to uh, a verse in Romans chapter eight, um, verse two, wh which says this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So yeah, this is a good question. So, so the Greek term namos is the word that's translated um, as law uh, throughout the book of Romans. And, and the, the term namas has a very broad semantic range, meaning it means a lot of things. And this is something that shows up a lot in scholarship on Paul, particularly understanding of Romans. If you look at you know the new perspective on Paul debates, which I've, um, I've delved into quite a bit, um, you see a lot of discussions about the use of the term law. And it's pretty well understood that Paul can use the term namas in many different ways. And he does this throughout the book of Romans. And he can even do this within a couple verses. He can use the term one way. And then all of a sudden, he uses the term in a totally different sense. Uh, and so when we read Romans, I think we're, we're tempted to think of, of law in, in the the systematic theological sense in which we use the term law. Specifically, if we think about Lutheranism, you know, you're thinking law and gospel. So law is God's commands, gospel, God's promises. And, and you might think that, therefore, every time the word namas or law or Torah in the Old Testament, every time that's used, it means command. That's not true. Um, it's not true in the Old Testament or the New Testament. So Psalm 119, for example, often law really means law in the sense we think of it, but it also is more broad in terms of just God's word in general. And, and our the Lutheran confessions do deal with this too, uh, speaking of a general sense of law, a broader sense, and then the narrower sense that's more particular when we're talking about the law gospel distinction, this is what we mean by law. But, but don't that take that to be, this is the only thing that that term means when it's used in the New or Old Testament. That would be a misunderstanding of that. And so if you read someone like Chemnitz or Gerhard, they're very explicit on all of the different ways in which the, the term law has been understood. And so Christians have always understood that the term law is used in many different ways. So uh, let's talk about what some of those ways are and then how we might understand some of this. So uh, a good example of this is um, Romans chapter three, which says in verse, I'm gonna look in, Okay, there are, yeah, there, there are a lot of references to law and namas in Romans 3, and, and it's used in different ways. So here's a good example of this. Um, okay, so let's look at verse 19 here. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is knowledge of sin. Now, there is a more of a, a very classical Lutheran use of the term law or nama. So we're thinking in terms of these are God's demands. You know, Paul has just outlined God's demands. He's outlined how the Gentiles have fallen short, then how the Jews have fallen short. The conclusion is there is this moral law. All have sinned, all have fallen short. Now they are brought to the point of mouths being stopped. Notice it says every mouth is stopped. It's not just talking about the Jewish law. This is a universal stopping of the mouths. This is a universal condemnation, the universal guilt upon the entire human race, which is why he outlines both Gentiles and Jews here, the point of the law. So this is what we think of as the moral law. Okay, this is God's commands, his demands for his creation. We've fallen short, we're guilty. Second use of the law stuff here. Classical kind of Lutheran understanding of, of what law is all about. Um, but then from there, we have a, then a very different use of the term law in the next verse, so verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law. Okay, so here it's still the same sense of law apart from the law. So we're saying we're not saved by works, uh, commanded by the law. We're not saved by obedience to law. We're saved by a righteousness that is apart from law. But then he goes on to say, um, okay, sorry, I lost my place here. Okay. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So within the same verse, we have two different senses of law. Now, when he says by the law and the prophets, now I'm using a new King James here, which capitalizes law in the second sense to try to get this idea that, yeah, it's talking about something else. Um, so law here is Torah, the, the law and the prophets is short for the Old Testament. You got the prophets and then you've got the law. Oftentimes it's it's law, prophets, Psalms, uh, you have the Tanakh. So, uh, but here it's just basically a summary to say, 
all of the Old Testament. So law specifically usually points to the books of Moses. Now, when you're thinking of the books of Moses, um, there's a lot of gospel in the books of Moses. So when you see law used there, it doesn't mean law apart from gospel. Um, you know, we look at Genesis, Genesis, you know, 315, the first gospel. Um, so we're not speaking just in terms of moral commands now. Now the term is being used to refer to particular books in the Bible um, in the same sense that we use the term gospels to refer to the stories of Jesus. There's plenty of law in the gospels. Um, so we have these different senses of the term. So that can be kind of confusing in, in that Paul uses nomos in these two totally different ways within the same verse. So context really is, is key here in understanding what's going on. Um, and you'd get really confused if you start to think every reference to nomos or law here is, is a reference to the moral law in the sense that we are usually thinking of it theologically. Um, then we have uh, Romans 8, 2, which I mentioned at the very beginning, which was part of this, this question, um, which says this. I'm going to start in verse, eight, uh, verse 1. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Um, so he's speaking about no condemnation, that this is legal language. You are not condemned. Uh, Christ has, has paid the price. You are set free from the law. You have died to the law, language that's used in, in the chapter just before this. Um, and then for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So here now he's using the law as basically uh, a way of saying the principle. Okay, so you could think of it as the principle of the spirit of life has set me free from that principle of sin and death. And so he's not using law here in the sense of moral law, or else he would be saying, for the moral law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the moral law of sin and death. Now, there's no moral law of sin and death, but this would, and if you read it in this sense, you're coming to basically a Pelagian conclusion of, oh, well, there was that old law that led to sin and death, but now Jesus has given me a new and better law, so I obey that law, therefore now I'm not condemned. Um, that clearly is not, is not what's going on, um, because this is then explained as Paul goes on. So you can't, he explains what this means that we're led by the law of the spirit of life in Christ, which made us free from the law of sin and death. He goes on to say in verse three, what the law could not do. So, so then he goes back to this other, this is how this is confusing because now he's going back to the sense of moral law. So, and now he's not saying the, because here he just said the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free. Uh, so he's not using it in the same sense there. So for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that, so what he's saying here, he's, he's giving an explanation of what he previously just said means. So he basically says the law could not do this. Okay. The law could not save Christ saved because he became one who um, took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh. He became a human though without himself having any sin. Um, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Now we are given the spirit and now through the work of Christ, we can begin to obey or fulfill the law. A lot of different things that are going on here. And you see how this can be very confusing if you read or understand this um, in, in the wrong way. So, but I think it's important here that he's not saying, because you could interpret this as there are two laws. There's the one law that leads to sin and death. And now we're saved by the new law. But if you, what I think is important is that in verse three, and in verse four, when he speaks about law, this is singular law. He's speaking about the same law that could not save. And that same law is one that is fulfilled in us who walk not by flesh, but according to the spirit. So the important thing is this isn't, he's not saying, oh, there's one law that's bad, but we're saved by the good law. Here he's saying, no, it's very clear that there is one law. 
But the problem is the law condemns sin. Now that we have the spirit, that same law can begin to be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, uh, but instead according to the spirit. So um, yeah, that's that's a little bit of an of a explanation of some of the ways that the terms the term law is used here. So generally, there are those three different senses. Um, that doesn't mean that totally explains it, um, but there are generally three different senses. Law meaning. Uh, Torah, just the books of the Old Testament, specifically the five books of Moses, law meaning moral law, um, and then law as a way of speaking about the, the, the principle, the principle of, of the spirit or the principle of sin and death. Um, and he, Paul purposefully plays with that term namas quite a bit. So it's got a, it's got a big range. It's important to understand that as you're, as you're reading through this. And, and sometimes law can then have a more particular reference to the specifically Jewish or ceremonial aspects of the law that identify the Jews as God's people as well. So that just to complicate things a little more.